check. out of Psalms. Psalms 145, starting in verse 1, says, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Let's pray. Almighty Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you in prayer, we we thank you so very much for everything you've given us. We thank you for the time we have to come together and to study your word and sing songs of praise and, and to think about all the many blessings and gifts you've given us, to, to think about your son and, and what, he, what he did for us on the cross and, and the example he set so we would have a, a pattern to follow. Lord, be with each of us and help us to to focus on you this morning, to put out all of the, the things that are going on, like drywall and 
taping and mudding and and focus on <laughs> focus on you and how amazing you are and how wonderful it's going to be when we're all with you in heaven help us to to grow in our faith to strive to do your will and not our own to remember that you are our god our king our creator help us to to humbly serve you forgive us when we fail to please you lord watch over those that are sick and hurting and help them to get better in jesus name we pray amen all right For communion, the sing I gave my life for thee. <clears throat> I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom be. Good morning. Anybody that doesn't have any of the communion cups, raise your hand and Derek will get you one. So, all right. Um, so this morning, uh, and every time I get asked to, to do one of these, um, I have a little bit of a, a deeper appreciation for uh, everybody that gets up here to do this, especially 
uh, Stephen and those that preach that come up here because um, uh, I've been coming here a long time and now that I'm, I'm up in a position like this, the, uh, the drive is to save all of your souls right now with what I've got to say. Um, and so it kind of, you know, it, it kind of gets you to where, you know, you, you sit and you think, you know, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? It's got to be epic. It's got to be amazing. Um, but this morning I kind of just settled on um, reading something from Corinthians that I've been uh, thinking hard on every time I come and take communion. I'm going to read the verses kind of backwards um, so that it kind of, uh, to me, flows a little bit different. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 11, and I'm going to start in verse 27. Eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord in the right way. Don't do it in a way that isn't worthy of him. If you do, you will be guilty. You'll be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone should take a careful look at themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. Whoever eats and drinks must recognize the body of Christ. If they don't, judgment will come upon them. That is why many of you are weak and sick. That is why a number, a number of you have died. We think we should think more carefully about what we are doing. Then we would not be found guilty for this. When the Lord judges us in this way, he corrects us. Then in the end, we will not be judged along with the rest of the world. And then if you go back up to verse 24, uh, it just goes back into when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body. It is given for you. Every time you eat it, do it in memory of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, do it in memory of me. If you would pray with me. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to all be here together this morning, Lord, to sing songs of praises to you, to uh, hear scriptures being read from your book. Father, the most uh, wonderful thing you've given us this morning is the ability to sit here and reflect on Christ's sacrifice for us, uh, for us imperfect sinners that uh, do things daily that um, go against how we should be, and yet you still were willing to come and sacrifice yourself for us so that we might spend eternity with you. We thank you for this, Lord, and we ask that as we take of these emblems that we can do it in a manner in which is pleasing to you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. would we'll pray one more time for the cup heavenly father we come to you again humbly thanking you for Jesus' sacrifice the blood that he shed on the cross that we're about to uh, drink from father we ask that we can all take a serious hard look at the emblems that we have uh, partaken in this morning and what they mean we ask that you would Help us throughout the rest of this service, Father, that we can continue to worship you and um, to please you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Back is slide, just I. Thank you. All right. The next song, we got a song coming up, but before that, let's talk about giving for just a just a second. All right. We all know, and I think we all recognize that we are blessed. And any of us that have been out of country, we know we are blessed. When you see, when you see how folks live. Each of us is doing pretty good. And all those good things that we have come from the Father. And part of, part of us growing in our faith is learning that what we have is not ours, but it's God's, and we are just stewards. 
And the tighter we try to hold on to the stuff that we have, the harder it is for God to bless us. So let's, let's pray for the offering. Almighty Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, it's, it's humbling for us to think of all the things that you've done for us. <laughs> and we know if we sat down and tried to list them all, we couldn't do it. But as we, as we take a, a moment to think about what you've done for us, we also hope that each of us will think hard about whether or not we put you first in our life, in our time, in our thoughts, and in our budgets. Help us to, to give with a cheerful heart, to give knowing that you gave us everything. And help us, Lord, to, that what we give will be used to further your kingdom, will be used wisely, and will help, help grow the church and help our community that we live in. Help us all to shine the light of your son and forgive us when we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. <clears throat> make me a servant, Lord, make me like you. For you are a servant, make me one too. Make me a servant, do what you must do. To make me a servant, make me like you. Take me and mold me and make Today I'm going to be reading from Matthew 6, 19 through 21 in the NIV version. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moths and virgin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I don't see a count time reminder, but uh, we probably ought to stand up so the little people can get out of here. God give us Christian homes. <laughs> God give us Christian homes. 
Homes where the Bible is loved and taught. Homes where the Master's will is sought. Homes crowned with beauty thy love hath wrought. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. Homes where the Father is true and strong. Homes that are free from the blight of wrong. Homes that are joyous with love and song. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. Homes where the mother in queenly quest strive to show others thy way is best. Homes where the Lord is an honored guest. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. Homes where the children are led to know Christ in his beauty who loves them so. Homes where the altar fires burn and glow. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian Good morning, family, assuming that's you out there. Uh, if you would please turn in your Bibles to the 50th Psalm, Psalm 50. While you're turning there, a little background, sometime around 1890, an archaeological team working for the British Museum in London unearthed some clay tablets in Sipur, Iraq. And on those tablets were inscribed an ancient Babylonian flood story of a time when the gods destroyed human beings with a flood. Now, one of the older versions of that story, since several have come to light since then, is the Atrahasis epic. And in this particular tale, one of the gods, Enlil, can't sleep. He can't sleep because human beings have multiplied like rabbits upon the face of the earth and they are just making too much noise. And so he decides to wipe them all out with a flood in order to get some peace and quiet. One of the other gods, Enki, has a human friend named Atrahasis and he warns him of the coming flood, tells him to build a boat, get his family in there and some critters in order to survive it. This Atrahasis does. Now, one of the things you and I need to realize is that the ancient Sumerians and Babylonians, for them, the gods and goddesses, though immortal and more powerful than us, had some of the same basic needs we humans do, like the need to sleep and the need to eat. However, there was a slight problem. The gods had created we human beings to do all their chores for them, like farming and cooking. And the animal sacrifices that the humans made to the gods were understood to be serving the gods' dinner. Now, once almost all the human beings were wiped out by the flood sent by Enlil, the gods and goddesses began to get thirsty and hungry. 
they started asking around as to whose bright idea it was to kill off all the cooks. But then the human Atrahasis, who'd survived the flood, came to the rescue. He offered sacrifices. And when the gods and goddesses began to smell the barbecue, they all rushed over there and gathered around it like flies. That was the understanding of the Sumerians and Babylonians as to why humans sacrificed to gods. The gods would starve otherwise. Now the ancient Israelites also made grain and animal sacrifices to Yahweh, the God of their ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was it also because Yahweh couldn't cook for himself? Psalm 50, beginning in verse 7, Yahweh says, Listen, my people, and I will speak. I will testify against you, Israel. I am God, your God. I bring no charges against you concerning your sacrifices or concerning your burnt offerings, which are ever before me. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Sacrifice thank offerings to God, fulfill your vows to the Most High, and call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. It's interesting that the God of the Israelites is not like the gods their pagan neighbors worship. This is kind of unique, which to me points to the Bible being different than all other ancient religions. The God of the Bible doesn't need us to feed him. He doesn't get hungry. And if he, even if he did start feeling a little peckish, he can take care of himself because he owns the whole world and everything in it. Now, a couple weeks ago, we examined some passages that reminded us of who God is. Now, we don't provide for him. Rather, he provides for us. Matthew 6, 31 through 33, do not worry, say, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now the reason that God can provide for us is that he's the owner and operator of this thing called the universe. Deuteronomy 10 and 14, To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heaven, the earth, and everything in it. From Haggai 2 and 8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares Almighty Yahweh. That makes you and I caretakers, managers, stewards of all the stuff in our lives. From our clothes, to our cars, to our bank accounts, to our talents, even to the members of our family. They and it all belong to God, just like you and I do, and He's placed these things in our care to manage them for Him. Why? Can't He manage the stuff Himself? Of course He can. But this gets back to the early chapters of Genesis when God planted the Garden of Eden and placed the human beings in the garden to take care of it be God's gardeners, if you will, and they were to enjoy all the fruits of their labor. But remember, there were two special trees in that garden. The tree of life that Adam and Eve had free access to, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they weren't supposed to eat. You know, it would have been a whole lot easier if God just had not planted that tree to begin with. So why did he? To give us a choice. Genuine love requires a choice. God didn't want robots. He didn't want mindless automatons. He wanted people who were genuinely devoted to him. They made a choice to do that. 
God places these things in our care to see what kind of choices we'll make, what kind of managers we will be. Will we manage for his glory or for ours? It's still making that same choice. And as managers, one day, each of us will give account of ourselves to God, Romans 14 and 12. So you think about the IRS auditing you? What about God auditing your life? Hmm. So what does it mean to be faithful stewards of the resources God has entrusted to our care? Now last week we looked at the biblical principles of first fruits and tithing. And that means demonstrating our trust and dependence on God by giving Him the first cut of what He's given us. Another principle of good stewardship is one we don't like to talk about, except to grouse. Right around the time the Apostle Paul was writing to the Christians in the capital city of Rome, there was some civil unrest, if you want to work your way over to Romans 13 in your Bible. The Roman Senator Cornelius Tacitus tells us that the people of Rome were beginning to protest. About what? They were demanding changes regarding taxes and how taxes were collected. The citizens were also denouncing the excessive greed of the revenue collectors. Now it seems that this civil unrest was bleeding into the church in Rome with Christians getting caught up in this political debate. It's always been a problem. Each of us always keep dragging the world with us into the church like toilet paper on the heel of your shoe. It's been going on forever, and we've not gotten any better about it. So this political debate over taxes was bleeding into the church in Rome. And that's when Paul wrote Romans 13. Let's look at the first seven verses. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, Whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you'll be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoers. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authority are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Now, there's some things Paul says here that... I don't agree with. Can I say that out loud? You were thinking it. Come on now. You were thinking, Paul, come on. No, no. We're Americans by gum. How did we get our start? By telling the rightful ruler to take a hike, right? The king of England, get out of here. So we kind of like our rebellion. And we think, you know, Paul, what you say is right. You know, honor the government, you know, submit to them because they're, they're there to punish wrongdoers. But we know of governments that abuse that power, don't we? Don't we know of governments that oppress people? And so I was like, Paul, hello, do you not know your history? Do you not know government? The thing is, Paul knew exactly what he was saying. Keep in mind, and Paul knew this, that the Roman government of Paul's day was not a government of the people elected by the people. What was it? It was a dictatorship. It was a totalitarian government. 
almost all the peoples outside of Italy who were part of the Roman Empire had become part of the Roman Empire, not by their own choice, but by conquest. To a Jew like Paul, this was far from a benevolent government, and yet he says, tell the line anyway. It's like, I'm, I'm having trouble with you, Paul, I really am. even given that system of government that they were under. What did the Apostle Paul tell the Christians in Rome who were witnessing and perhaps being influenced by these anti-tax protests? What did he tell them? You've heard it. Don't pretend you didn't. Submit to them, and if you owe taxes, pay taxes. Now, Paul was repeating the same thing Jesus said. You may recall that Jesus' opponents tried to put him in double jeopardy by publicly asking him if it was lawful to pay taxes to the Roman occupiers. Now, to many Jews, paying taxes to Rome was treason against God. And to the Romans, not paying taxes was treason against against Caesar. So this was a no-win situation they hoped to put Jesus in. Get him alienated from the populace or get him executed by the Romans. Either way, his opponents win. Jesus famously responded in Matthew 22, 19 through 21, show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked him, whose image and inscription is this? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, well, then give back to Caesar what's Caesar's, and to God what's God's. Thus, part of exercising God-honoring stewardship of the resources that he's placed in our care is to pay our taxes. Now, there's two principles to keep in mind when doing so. And I'm just random thought here. There used to be this commercial I, I really liked comes to paying taxes. There's this teenager who has his first job at a fast food joint and he's looking forward to his first fat paycheck and what he's going to buy with it. And he looks at this scrawny little paycheck and he says, who's FICA? And who said he could take my money? <laughs> That's how I feel. There's two principles to keep in mind when it comes to paying our taxes. First, Throughout Scripture, God expresses His extreme displeasure at cheating and dishonesty. Proverbs 20 and 10 is one of many passages that say, False weights and unequal measures, the Lord detests double standards of every kind. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says, There are six things the Lord hates, seven which are an abomination to him, and then in the list that follows, lying is counted twice. God commanded the Israelites, you must not be unfair in measurements of length, weight, or volume. You are to have honest balances, honest weights, an honest dry measure, and an honest liquid measure. I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, Leviticus 19 35 and 36. So when we're doing our taxes, we practice good stewardship by being honest with our bookkeeping. By the way, this church family is blessed with a very excellent treasure and bookkeeper. Corey and Sarah, they put in long hours and they make sure we do things right. That's to be appreciated. A second principle of paying our taxes as good stewards of God's resources involves wisdom. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, says Colossians 4 and verse 5. Jesus told us to be wise as serpents, yet innocent as doves in Matthew 10 and 16. 
What that means with regard to paying taxes is that we need to be informed. It's right and proper to take legitimate tax breaks. Emphasis on legitimate. If you try to get a Social Security number for your dog and pass it off as a dependent, no, that's, that's not kosher. We're not called to give Caesar more than Caesar's due. Trust me, the government does not need your charity. But other people do. When we pay more than we should for taxes or for anything else, that limits our ability to share with those in genuine need. Now there's more to stewardship than observing the principle of first fruits and paying taxes to whom taxes are due. We'll save those teachings for another lesson that just thrills you to hear that, I know. For now, let's simply remember that God prizes integrity in the management of the resources that he's loaned us. Consider as an example of integrity the prophet Daniel. He was working in the administration of a government that had invaded his homeland and kidnapped him. He had every earthly excuse to pursue his own self-interest and undermine the government, get back at them in any way he could. Yet what are we told about how Daniel went about his duties? In Daniel chapter 6, the first four verses, Darius, again a totalitarian government, decided to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, stationed throughout the realm, and over them three administrators, including Daniel. These satraps would be accountable to them so that the king would not be defrauded. Daniel distinguished himself above the administrators and satraps because he had an excellent spirit. So the king planned to send him over the whole realm. The administrators and satraps, therefore, kept trying to find a charge against Daniel regarding the kingdom. They were just digging all through his books. They could find no charge or corruption for he was trustworthy and no negligence or corruption was found in him as Christ's ambassadors on earth may what is said of Daniel be true of us as well that we manifest an excellent spirit that we prove trustworthy with no negligence or corruption found in us as we manage the resources God has entrusted to us for His glory and honor. Thanks for listening, family. We'll come to a time in our assembly that we've set aside for prayer needs and other needs that, for that matter. In a moment, we're going to stand and, and sing a hymn, and during that hymn, you can come up here, and one of our shepherds will visit with you and pray with you and share what you want shared with the church family. If that's a little too public for you, again, as we stand and sing, uh, another of our shepherds and his wife will head out these doors. They'll go all the way down the hallway to the last door on the right before the double doors. And they will stay down there in the library and just wait for anybody who wants to come down and just have some private talk and prayer and sharing time with them. Whatever you need, we encourage you to make it known as we stand and as we sing. Earth, O 